Ritchie. Coming beyond Walker. Pugh. Pugh! That'll do it! That will do it! Pugh for Bournemouth! The roof of the Gold Sands is raised! Everyone here knows what that could mean to this football Hi and welcome to the latest video in the interview series on Back of the Net, the AFC Bournemouth podcast. We are really privileged to have been joined by some Cherries greats during this lockdown period. Now, if you haven't seen the last one with Tommy Heffernan, uh, that video came out on Thursday. Do check it out because it is hilarious. But if you're not too great with swear words, all I'll say is maybe give it a miss because he has some blinds quite a bit and also has some very forthright opinions. But with over a thousand views already for that video, it was a classic, one of our favourites, we've got to say. Now, as we're waiting for our guests to arrive, I suppose we can tell you about the kit news yesterday, 7.45pm across the socials. AFC Bournemouth released the images of the kit that we're going to be playing in in the remaining nine games. Of course. Whether there'll be an away version or not, I don't know. Maybe eight of the nine will be playing in that kit, but it looks all right, doesn't it? Vitality across the front of the shirt, and it's got that red into black gradient and vice versa. I'm really liking it. Unfortunately, not available to buy just yet, but we will next season with the new sponsor, whoever that will be. So, yeah, let us know what you think about that kit. Uh, because, I mean, my personal opinion, I absolutely love it. And it's a bit of a variation that we've not had for quite a while on the shirt. We've had many similar designs, but this is, um, yeah, broken, broken the trend somewhat. So, yeah, really liking it. As we're waiting for tonight's guest to appear, if you've not seen any of our stuff before or heard the podcast, we've been doing it all season on YouTube and since 2016 on the podcast. And whatever division we're in next season, well, we're going to be doing it again. So here's the stuff that you'll have to look forward to. But let's see a highlights reel of what we've been up to this season. I'll be honest, no. Um, yeah, no Fraser, he's gone onto the bench as well. Lewis Cook's there too. Uh, Rambo in goal, as you would expect. Uh, the back four, as we hope. So. Thanks very much. To all. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's asking you out. Uh, yeah, so we'll carry on. He's being escorted out. I've actually had a nightmare. My worst week ever. Eddie Al said he wanted it spicy. <laughs> yeah. It's certainly spicy. <laughs> I hope they lose their derby as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's a match, match warm shirt. Yeah, yeah. Mount. Fair play. Cameras, I suppose cameras, not in the pub, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the ground. And the big six pointer that's coming out. Okay. You can swear it's absolutely yeah. fine. Um,
are amazing that does bring back some amazing memories right our guests have arrived uh, but firstly mr jeff hayward jeff how are you doing very good sam thank you for having me have you recovered from that tommy heffernan interview uh not quite <laughs> <laughs> he had some opinions didn't he um, very forthright yeah i'm sure the guys that we uh have today will be um Exactly the same, hopefully. Well, firstly, we've got a Scottish international who clocked up over 250 appearances for the Cherries. He was uh, he put in some great uh, defensive performances on the pitch, but also had a desire to get forward, full of energy, uh, stayed around with us for around 10 seasons. So this meant his services to the club uh, resulted in a testimonial match against AC Milan in September 2016. Uh, and then alongside him today is a midfielder who wore the red and black for six years under Sean O'Driscoll before linking up with him again at Doncaster Rovers, where he spent another significant chunk of his career. Now at AFC Bournemouth, he has a role coaching the youth, as does Warren Cummings. Uh, so, yeah, it's Brian Stock and Warren Cummings. How are you today, gents? Good, Hi, Sam. You. Very well, thank you. Good, good. Nice to uh, have you on. We're going to try to go through things in sort of time order um, in this interview. Um, Brian, uh, uh, after a spell with the youth, because you came up through the youth system, I think, you, you know, you made your debut for Bournemouth back in January 2000. So you had, you had a bit of a taster of Mel Machin before being managed by Sean and Driscoll. Then Warren, you came in on loan October that season. So. Um, yeah, uh, Brian, is it right that you came through the youth system at Bournemouth? Is that right? Yeah, um, I signed um, as a 15-year-old, um, went into the youth team. And in my first year, they decided to scrap the youth team. So um, Sean O'Driscoll was the youth team manager at the time. Um, learned a hell of a lot out of, um, you know, how he coached and, and how he thought about the game. Um, and obviously, Mel Machen was the manager who who gave me my first uh, team debut. So uh, it was a little bit up and down coming through the youth system, um, but I was one of three players out of the youth team that managed to make that grade. And uh, yeah. Who were the other two, Brian? Uh, Danny Smith and James Ford. So you... Uh, we, also had, we also had Steve Lovell um, at the time. He Steve through. Lovell. What a player he was. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Warren, what about your own journey? Um, well, obviously, I grew up in the youth team at um, Chelsea, and then my first loan move uh, was to go to Bournemouth in October, as you mentioned, of the 2000-2001 season. Uh, so joined for three months initially. I uh, loved my time. Uh, you know, but when I first joined, we were struggling a little bit in the relegation zone, you know, teetering on the edge, but coinciding with uh, Jermaine Defoe signing, um, I think, the week after me. Uh, very fortunate we had quite a successful three months while I was there. I wanted to stay longer, unfortunately. Circumstance didn't allow me to stay uh, for longer because uh, my parent club didn't allow it at that moment, which I was disappointed in. So the key to <laughs> success in that 10-match period was your signing rather than Jermaine Defoe because you were presumably setting all the goals up for him, were you? Well, funny you should say that. I did get the assist for his first goal for Bournemouth uh, with a very, uh, unlike me, right foot cross away to Stoke. Um, and he scored a header. Um, so I have got the assist, uh, but I don't think I can really claim uh, that the success of that period was down to my signing rather than his. Uh, ju just on Jermaine Defoe, like we played a, um, a reserve game away at Brentford and we all uh, got the minibus to the game at the time. And I got on the minibus after the game, uh, got to the back and we weren't introduced to anyone, but there was there was this kid sat at the back dressed head to toe in the biggest umbro gear you've ever seen like <laughs> absolutely drenched in it um he said oh, i'm gonna come uh, and play first team how old are you i think he said i think he said he was 17 at the time um yeah and we were a little bit like right okay uh, and it turned out to be jermaine defoe and you know what an impact he had it, it quite quite funny because jermaine got signed by sean um and i know that obviously mel machin was above him and Sean at the time was dictated to slightly. I know the story that Mel actually decided to sign Jermaine and um, Sean had taken Jermaine into training on his first day. And he wasn't particularly keen that he didn't actually influence the signing at that moment. And he said to a couple of the senior players, oh, rough this kid up, see what he's all about. So a couple of the senior players had the task in that training session of booting him up and down the pitch just to see if he could handle it. And yeah, he could handle it okay. 
<laughs> I think um, Trevor Watkins, when he came on the chat, said he he first saw Jermaine in the, like shoot magazine, no, four four two magazine. It was it was like in the one to watch section because he was penning a column for shoot, um, you know, based on Wembley and the aftermath of that. And um, you know, a couple of years later, he saw Jermaine, and apparently. He said he put it on Mel's desk, but whether these stories are true or not, maybe he was taking credit for a signing when he made some other judgments, like the signing of Roger Bolly, Jeff, that didn't go down too well, did it? So maybe he was I'd rather be remembered for Jermaine Defoe than Roger Bolly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so did you have any, um, we'll start with Brian, did you ever have any sort of footballing heroes when you uh, grew up? Um, not, not really. I mean, I was obsessed with watching football, so I, I, I watched all the World Cup. Um, back then it was on VHS. Um, yeah. You know, I watched him sort of day and night, really. Um, my, my brother was a huge Man United supporter and was an influence in my early days of my career. Um, so, you know, obviously you, you tend to get swayed by, you know, who they support. And, you know, the likes of Ryan Giggs, Eric Cantona, uh, young Paul Scholes, David Beckham, those sort of players were the people that I probably would look up to the most. And how old are you, Brian? I'm 38. Uh, yeah, same as me. So that's a lie. <laughs> Definitely older. Well, yeah. What was the first World Cup or Euros that you really remember? Oh, um, I think it was probably in '94. Really, oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I used to, I used to look back at, like, you know, previous like of Pele and Maradona and, you know, all those sort of videos back in the day. You know, I, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. Mm, I remember uh, Italia '90 as a nine-year-old. Uh, I couldn't remember anything of the 88 Euros, um, but that's that's my first football memory. So, yeah, heroes, Warren, when you grew up. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily I had any football and heroes. Like Brian said, uh, I watched a lot of football um, when I was a young youngster. Uh, my biggest influence would be my father uh, and still is, even not playing football anymore. Uh, he would give me a lot of good guidance. So he would have been my influence rather than a hero in respect of football. Um, my memory of World Cups is the 1986 World Cup because uh, I got a, like Brian said, a VHS uh, video um, and it's called Hero and it's the story of the 86 World Cup and I actually watched it long ago and it's just fantastic. It's narrated by Michael Caine uh, and I, so I grew up adoring Maradona just because of that one video. Yeah, what was your first uh, memory, Jeff? Was it Uruguay 1930 or what? I can't <laughs> uh... I remember watching the World Cup in Mexico 1970 on a really grainy, you know, that grainy footage of those uh, those games. And I remember I remember crying after England got knocked out by Germany after we were two 0 up and lost three two. And I remember watching the uh, the the final of Brazil Italy four one, which was some game. But yeah, yeah, I'm quite old, obviously. Um, so you both played under Sean O'Driscoll. Warren, I, coming from Chelsea, Sean must Sean quickly got a reputation for playing football the right way, um, which must have helped when when Chelsea loaned you loaned you out to us in the first place. But what was he like as a as a, a coach, and and what was his style? Uh, as a coach, he, he he was quiet as you can imagine. He um, didn't say a lot, but what he did say was very powerful. His messages were very good. Um, he gave the players a lot of um, influence on how we wanted to affect the game as a team for ourselves rather than him having to dictate as the manager. Um, so we were given a lot of that, uh, which is really something that I hadn't came across before because all the other coaches I'd ever seen would, up until that point uh, were people that were very direct. They would tell you how they wanted it to be and it had to be that way. It was, it was black or white. Whereas with Sean, you know, he gave us the power while we're on the pitch to allow to make decisions. And as long as we could come up with a reason for changing something, and there were games that we did actually, as players, we changed the formation on the pitch if we didn't think something was working particularly well. And as long as we could back it up with a rationale as to why we were doing it, Sean allowed us that. And it was something really impressive, something before his, I never seen it and, and I've not really come across much of it since. Mm, I think during the end of his tenure at Bournemouth, I know that some fans got a bit um, frustrated with the style of play and he was sort of had the tag of sideways Bournemouth for a while. But do you think that's more just because he liked to play, you know, the patient way rather than hoof it up pitch and, you know, hit Fletch, who's going to then knock it down sort of thing? He, he actually liked to play football the right way. 
Yeah, I, I can understand that why there might have been frustrations. But yes, yeah, certainly keeping the ball was more important to Sean than, than anything else. Controlling how a football match looked like. And also, if I remember rightly, at the end of his time, with the greatest of respects to the squad that he left when he went to Doncaster, it wasn't the same squad he had two years previous. You know, the players, four or five of the better players, Brian included, had left that squad. So the style of play could never have really replicated that period of time because, with respect, I don't think the players within it were as good as what we'd had before. Do you think, Brian, that, that clubs have a style? I mean, a lot's talked about um, the way that Sean played. And I, I remember Harry played a similar way. Uh, and Eddie obviously plays football the right way. Do you think Do you think that's the case? And, and that's presumably why some managers like Jimmy Quinn and Tony Pulis don't last that long because they want to change it. Um, well, I, I used to always hear that the fact that Sean only has like a plan A and it used to make me laugh because the amount of detail that he would put into us leading up to a game is just unbelievable. He would focus on something that we would think, what's he, you know, what's he talking about here? But we'll go along with it, we'll buy into it. And it would come out in the game. And next week, you'd be talking to your mate saying, you know, that, you know what he said last week? How true was that? You know, the way he thought about games, you know, you would, although we still tried to stick to our passing game type thing, but there was a plan B, there was a plan C, plan D. And it might not necessarily look like um, like route one to the, like this passing style of play that he wanted to play. But there was there were certain things, certain adjustments that he would make to give us the best platform to play. Hmm. Now, Brian, now when you played for us, obviously you played in three different stadiums that we called home in the in a very short spell of time. Obviously, the old Dean Court, which got shifted around 90 degrees. When you started playing for us, we, you did it have like two stands or whatever? Because I know that they shut off it, you know, they, they sort of closed it off stand by stand, didn't they? Well, I mean, I played my first game against Oldham at the old Dean Court um, before they actually moved, the, you know, the ground. Um, I had the... Uh, the pleasure and in, 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 as a youth team player of actually having to clean that. Um, so I was delighted they, were, they made that decision to move the stadium because it was <laughs> terrible. It was painful. Like we wouldn't leave there till half five. And, you know, obviously they didn't have the money to replace carpets. So we had to water the carpets in order to hoover them. It was that bad. Um, but, you know, obviously going to uh, Dorchester could have been a challenging time. Um, leading up to that, we, we actually hadn't registered a win. Um, so it was desperate times at that at that moment, and um, I thought we picked up enough points at Dorchester, um, um, and yeah, obviously, you know, for the for the club to progress, um, that was a must. Yeah, and Jeff, there was a, a match at the Vitality, well, the Fitness First Stadium, as it was at the time, and uh, not a bad one for Stocky, was it? Do you remember that game? Well, I, I, I remember there was a certain Brian Stock scored the first goal in that new stadium. Did you want to talk us through it? Just about remember it. Um, yeah, though, uh, obviously the stadium's changed a few times. So this, these quiz questions, which I used to get told, oh, you're going to be in quizzes for the next few years. It's probably gone out the window now. But um, I, I mean, we were playing Wrexham, uh, ball over the top. Warren Feeney used his pace to get him behind, um, cut back um, to Derek Holmes, who, you know, dummied it for me to uh, sort of break from midfield to score. Um, and at the time, like, I didn't really actually think much of it at the time, but when I got into half time and, you know, Peter Grant was saying, I can't believe you scored the first goal at the stadium that started to sort of, you know, trigger, you know, you know, a special moment. And another person who scored, uh, Jason Tindall. I mean, what a goal that was. That was straight from a corner. I think volleyed into the top left corner in front of the North stand. Ridiculous finish, but Jason Tindall, yeah. you know, yourself, um, Eddie played, Carl Fletcher, Stephen Purchase, Richard Hughes, Gareth Stewart. Um, and all of you have had some role in the club over the years. Of course, you're the under-14s now. Um, what is it about AFC Bournemouth that makes ex-pros want to stick around? Well, firstly, he sent me that video anyway. So he, uh, you know, he reminded me that about a couple of weeks ago. So um, it's a great finish. Um, yeah. You know, it's a great occasion for the, for the club. Um, you know, and a, a really good memory of mine. Um, you know, obviously, you know, having the, the likes of, you know, working alongside Warren, um, Sean Cooper, Alan Connell, you know, the players that you mentioned. Uh, I think it, I think the main thing is that we all have the same sort of beliefs, the same work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're looking at the transition of children, hopefully, you know, in years to come, where they come through the system and into the first team, that might be a smooth transition. Um, having, 
having that. Um, that's not to, to say, you know, there's any disrespect to the other staff because, the, you know, the actual staff that we have in the academy are excellent. Um, we've got some up and coming, you know, talent in terms of coaches, um, some experience in there as well. So we've got a really good blend. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I, I was going to say, with with all the talent uh, that we've got around at the moment and the club doing so well in the in the Premier League, you must be so excited about the training facility as well, aren't you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's vitally important that while we are a Premier League club, that hopefully we do get that um, training ground because for a number of reasons, you know, we've got two or three venues that we use currently and we're very fortunate that the Camford Park Arena for the children is a great uh, place to have, but unfortunately we can't use that uh, in the winter months. So we're kind of restricted with our area size because we moved to another venue um, under the lights because obviously Camford's not lit up. Um, so I think it's really important that the club hopefully leaves that legacy for the for the children in the academy and also think while the academy will be training alongside the first team at the same venue, you know, what an inspiration that will be for our kids to look yeah. to the current group of players to see them every day and aspire to go and do what they're doing. Obviously, we know that the... Uh training ground at the moment is not sort of moving as quick as hoped but obviously coronavirus has got um it's has had its effect on that and also you know the premier league stakes of the club as well you know you can't help but think that might have a bearing but apparently it won't and it's going to happen anyway but in terms of us being in the premier league it must be great in some ways warren uh because of all the money that comes through but also for the kids that are being brought up through the youth system Surely, the you know the better we are in the Premier League, the less chances that the youth would have. Would that be a fair assessment? Uh, that's a very fair assessment because the higher the level that the first team are currently at, then it is going to be harder for our kids. But also, I think maybe the advantage of that is that we have to push their boundaries as children even higher. They know that the markers got to be up there now. Whereas if we were in a Championship or a League League One um, league then you know it might be an easier transition for them but if they are going to excel and they are going to become an afc bournemouth player and that's why we do the job that we do then they have to be that good so yeah it's, it's a maybe a double-edged sword but then on the flip side if they don't become afc bournemouth players then maybe we might create players for the game and they'll still have a career but maybe not in the premier league with afc bournemouth so there's a lot of ifs and buts and you can spin it any way you want you know we just want the kids to be as good as they can be and hopefully the ultimate dream is to become a AFC Bournemouth player in the Premier League. So, um, going back to your playing times, one of the big seasons for us was 2003 when um, when we got to the uh, playoff finals and got promotion. But the season before that was, was a tough one. What were the key differences between that side that got relegated, do you think, and the one that got promoted eventually in 02-03? Brian? Um, obviously, you know, at a club like AFC Bournemouth, um, you know, back then in the day, you know, financial constraints were, were a massive problem. Um, that there were the squad sizes was was an issue, uh, you know, and obviously the budget come into play. So, you know, there were certain times where, you know, I was, for instance, I was coming through, you know, I wasn't knowing near the polished article whatsoever, you know, and I, I had to learn quite quickly. Um, but I think, you know, having that belief, having that um, sort of the mentality that everyone buys into, keeping the squad together, adding one or two players, you know, I think, you know, I thought that, that you know, that that was probably the, the, the key for me. And, you know, the morale in the squad was excellent. And, yeah, you know, and obviously, you know, going to, the, you know, the playoffs and winning at a venue like that was, a, you know, was a special occasion for everyone. Surely the difference is Warren coming back and um, your big Fletch, surely, my Warren. Yeah, I'm not sure about that either. I'd like to take credit for it, but no, I don't think so. I think, I think obviously, I didn't see the season before when we were relegated, but it was a major surprise to me to see that squad get relegated, knowing how good some of the individuals within it were. Um, when I came back, it was very much a side that played good stuff in that league, and it was very apparent to me that I felt that this is a squad that had to be promoted, and as good as the playoff final was, and, you know, if you could, I think it's often said, if you could pick a route to get promoted, that might be the way to do it because it is a special occasion, as Brian said. But I do actually think that that squad should have went up automatically with what we had. And you were both used 
quite frequently during that promotion season in 2003. What, what, what do you think was special about the team and, and the individuals? What were the strengths and weaknesses within that, that side? Um, I, I mean, there was, you know, the flexibility for, for certain individuals. Um, I mean, you know, leading up to the game, we stayed at the Vale of Glamorgan and we trained inside and uh, obviously was doing a bit of team shape and, you know, Warren got injured. And at the time, I wasn't playing at all. So I was on the bench. Um, Stephen Purchase was very flexible, um, playing very well, uh, and he was going to play in the middle of the park. But um, with Warren having his injury, you know, I think Stephen Purchase was going to go and play fullback and I was going to play central midfield. Um, uh, but Lazarus obviously went and got his uh, medication and, you know, and he, no one could, could believe that he actually was fit to play, you know, um, and, you know, had a tremendous game. Um, you know, we almost sort of needed him to play in order to to win. Um, like Warren said to me earlier, um, we didn't play particularly well, but, you know, we scored some great goals. Um, and the team, you know, it, it didn't matter who played at the time. You know, it, it is what it was. And, you, you know, I was I was just lucky that I actually got some minutes towards the end. Um, so I was thankful for Sean for putting me on, even though the game was won. So you tell us about the 24 hours preceding that, the fixture of Warren. What happened? Um, so Neil Young and me were walking towards training. I used to get on well with Youngie. We're walking into that venue that Brian said about. And Youngie actually turned to me and said, God, can you imagine we went over our ankle today? I was like, don't say that. And this is what this is what <laughs> is truth. He did it and I did it, but I did it worse than him. <laughs> so um I was trying to get ice on it. And next minute, um, we're in Cardiff and the physio at the time, Jim Marshall, he drove me back to Southampton to see an ankle specialist and um, the day before the game. Um, and he said, look, your ligaments are torn. Uh, you can get, you can have an injection, strap it up, see how you get on. But I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. So we go back to Cardiff on the same day. Uh, I'm on crutches and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to play. So the next day, I just put loads of ice on it, took loads of um, tablets. Peter Grant took me for a fitness test and it didn't feel particularly great, but I felt like I could play. And then it was up to Sean whether to decide whether to play me or not. Uh, and fortunate enough, I just think probably the adrenaline of the occasion, it made me actually not even think about actually the ankle at all. I felt it after the game. I remember that. Wow. And do you think that kind of injury would be risked in the same way today or do, not at all? Uh, I don't know. Well, maybe, like Brian said, maybe at the time needs must. You know, you want your probably your natural left back to play. Not that it would have made a difference, and it's something that Brian and me have a little giggle about now that <laughs> my injury and me coming back stopped him from starting the match. Uh, but no, I can't see it happening too often these days. But listen, it's dressed up that it was bad, and it was bad, but it wasn't so bad that I was a miracle and I was able to play. Obviously, and it was. I was just very fortunate that it wasn't so bad that it kept me out. What do you remember of the the night before the match? I mean, was there was there a lot of tension and pressure, or were you just looking forward to the game? Well, there's a lot of tension and pressure for me. I know that when I'm laying in my bed with my foot up and like icing it and going, oh, "What's going on here?" Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I can only talk selfishly. So, like Brian and all the boys, they all had a pre-match meal and done all the normal lead up to a match. Mine's looked completely different because I never got back to the hotel until like past 10 o'clock and I'm on crutches and I'm straight to bed. I'm not eating. And so I, I can't tell you what it looked like for the rest of them. Wow. And we had only played, uh, Brian, we, we'd only played Lincoln a few matches before in the league and we lost there, but it felt like a good loss, if that makes any sense, because I felt we dominated the game, um, yet somehow ended up on the losing side. So did you, players have that in the back of their minds ahead of this fixture? No, I don't think so. But for me, that's probably one of the things that um, I had on quite a few occasions when I worked with Sean O'Driscoll, where we would come off in games, having done everything we could to win the game, um, but not convert our chances. Um, I, I can count, you know, countless times where that's happened. Um, but I don't think so. I don't think, you know, players, I think naturally they might feel a bit nervous given the occasion, the attendance, you know, um, and what's at stake. But I don't think they would have ever looked into that and thought to themselves, you know, we are up against, you know, a team like Lincoln. You know, I don't think there was any fear in that at all. Hmm. It was a terrific atmosphere in the in the stadium. Were the players aware of that, Brian? 
Oh, most definitely, you know, and I think one of the biggest things that always stays in my mind is, you know, and I'm sure every player will be different, but, you know, leading up, uh, driving up to the stadium, like seeing the supporters, seeing the flags, the banners, face paints, you know, the lot, you know, it means a lot to the fans and certain music gets played, which then, you know, to this day, I still remember, you know, so there is a lot of emotions that go into an occasion like that. And I think the biggest thing in those with, you know, sharing it with all your friends and your family is that you want to win the game, um, you know, because to be in that sort of occasion and, and be on the losing team, you know, it probably, you know, although I've been fortunate enough not to actually experience that, um, you know, that's probably the main thing that, you you know, you want to try and achieve. One thing that the squad I don't think had to do is unlike Wembley, where Fletch and Co were doing a staying alive rendition at the Opera House, where they're walking down the stairs and recorded a song. You didn't have to do a song, I don't think, but there was a recording called Go South that got played before the game. And I don't know if I like it or not. It was it seemed pretty cringy at the time with thirty thousand Bournemouth fans flag waving or whatever. But what did you make of the um match, Warren? Because the first sort of half an hour, um, I felt it was fairly even in that game yeah I watched it back funny my, all my family sat down and watched it because obviously this is a different period and when when the club re-screened it on the website a couple of weeks ago I watched it back and the first time I've seen it probably since a year after the game so probably 15 years uh, I thought we were poor for the first 30 minutes I really did I thought we didn't pass the ball particularly well I thought Lincoln were very much in the game um, I think the thing for us that happened within it is we had two moments, we scored at good times. Um, you know, the thing with Lincoln was they were a very big physical team and that was proven that they scored two headers, one from a corner, one from a, a cross into the box. And that was always their biggest threat. Um, but we picked up good moments. The Carl Fletcher goal, I think, on half time was a big thing. So to go in with a lead in a first half that you've not played particularly well, uh, was a big thing for us. Just settle the nerves down after, obviously, they've equalised. You must have been surprised at yeah. the volley, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised. That, I'm not surprised he took his top off. I'm not surprised about <laughs> that. We've seen that a few times. Um, but, yeah, no, it was a great finish, to be fair. But, yeah, you're right. I'm not sure how he got his leg up there, to be fair. Cool. It's, um, on the interview that we had with Flex the other day, he, he was obviously pumped in beforehand, and he's and even in the celebration, he grabbed Wade, Ele uh, Wade Elliott's neck it's so hard. Head that, head. Yeah, and he and you can see at half time when Wade's coming up, you know, Wade celebrate with Carl Fletcher for 2 1, the blood streaming down the back of his neck, even after that. Um, yeah. but Fletch had a great game in that because he not only scored that goal but set up Gareth O'Connor. It's a bit frustrating for Fletch the way that Sky Sports camera angles were. I think it was a big hoof from Mossy, and then yeah. Fletch chested it down and managed to get it on the turn to Gareth O'Connor that set him free. But he, he did have a really good game, didn't he, Fletch? He had a fantastic game, yeah. I mean, looking back, I forgot actually how well he played, not just his goal, but that was a really good, like you say, the way you just described how we set up Gaz for his goal. Well, that was a lot of good performances from a, from a lot of players within it. I thought individually we did quite well all of us but as a collective I, as much as it was a great result and we scored good goals I still felt watching back you know it wasn't the team that I remember playing and I think we were capable of playing a better brand of football than we did on that particular day but listen like Brian said I mean winning the game is the most important thing and to score five goals on an occasion like that was huge. At what time from what age did you start to relax Brian because it wasn't easy watching it in the stadium even when we were uh, <laughs> two goals clear. I was on and off within about five minutes. So I didn't really have much time to think about it. Uh, I remember going up to the lads and shaking hands to the players that lost. Um, uh, and to be honest, I don't really remember much about the game. You know, uh, it's it's a bit of a blur. I remember a lot before and after, um, but the actual occasion, I don't really, I don't really remember much about it. I should probably watch the game back. What's um. Sean O'Driscoll like in celebration because I mean Eddie Howe seems to be very reserved and even though he's internally happy on the exterior he doesn't seem to you know give much away. I remember when uh, Doncaster got promoted um, against Leeds with that James Hayter diving header uh, and Sky Sports cameras straight after the whistle go straight up to Sean O'Driscoll and they interview him say you know like, how are you feeling and he said something along the lines of oh you know I can murder a cup of tea and it's just he seems to be very cool and calm and collected did he have a demeanour behind the scenes? Like, was he a teacup thrower at all? Um, you know, sometimes you like players would come to the club and would be like, 
you know, he doesn't speak to me. I, I, you know, and I'd be like, especially at Donkster, where I was captain, I'd have to be that in-between sort of player that, you know, don't worry, you know, don't take it personally. It's just the way he is. Um, and he was like that with the media. Um, but, you know, what a, what a great coach, um, you know, and, and when you look at the players that he coached who are coaching for Bournemouth now, I don't think there are many that he's probably worked with that, you know, are now sort of going to that stage of their careers. You know, um, he managed to create a, an environment where you used to think about the game. And I think when I look at the coaches, uh, the likes of Warren, Sean and Alan, you know, that I can see sort of similarities in the way that they want the players to try and think about the game. And you mentioned, Warren, that uh, the side looked too good to go down the previous season. When you got promoted, did you think the side was capable of kicking on? Because I think a lot of the fans felt that we had a lot of talent in that squad. Yeah, I think we had a good mix. Um, we had quite a young squad, other than probably Youngie, uh, Mossy and Fletch at the time. But then uh, the other ones had a lot of potential. So there was a lot coming through, you know. And I think the proof was in, really, when you see... When that squad did break up, you know, you can pick five or six players. You've got Carl Fletcher, Brian, Wade Elliott, Gareth O'Connor, um, and they all went on to play for better clubs in better leagues. Uh, and that would have, that gave me confidence going into the following season, thinking, knowing what we had around us, that we had such a good group of players for the level. And I think we were too good to be in League 2 at that point. Uh, and League 1 was certainly at least where we should have been. So I had no, no problems about the following season, thinking about what we would probably be capable of achieving we had some issues off the pitch during um the next couple of seasons which involved the sale and lease back of the stadium were the players really um sort of aware of that and did it affect anything on the pitch warren um yeah we were certainly aware we were aware of the financial constraints of the of the club all the time you know and you know i'm not talking out of terms so you know we never we never got paid our wages on time ever for that first few years I was back at the club. Like we never got paid on the last day of the month or if we did, it wasn't the full amount. So we always knew that the club were always on a sticky wicket in that respect. And the sale and the lease had to happen at that time to pay off the debts that we had and just keep the thing rolling. And when uh, Sean moved on, what was that, 2006, I think, um, it, what were your feelings then? I mean, it was short, shortly after that you followed him to Doncaster, wasn't it, Brian? Um, yeah, I mean, when I actually left Bournemouth, um, it was against his wishes, um, you know, and it was it, it was probably a situation where I had to go um, selfishly. And um, although he tried to put a stop to the move and, you know, given the timing of it on a Friday afternoon, it didn't, didn't give him a chance to sort of replace me the following day. Um, but when you look at, you know, when you look sort of selfishly, you know, you have to sort of try and force these situations. And um, when things didn't work out for me at Preston and then Sean then decided to go to Doncaster, um, he called me up basically on the way up to Doncaster and asking me to join him. Um, I, I had no hesitation in saying yes. Mm. It's... Um... Yeah, I mean, it's testament to your quality on the pitch that you, you know, you had that move. But Warren, I mean, you were a fan's favourite and, you know, we always thought you put in 110%. And, you know, it seems like you could have got a move, um, you know, to a bigger club. Um, did you ever have any offers or, you know, could you have gone? Um, no, there wasn't anything concrete. I mean, I felt like the 2004-2005 season, um, I thought the there was whispers that in the background that at the end of that season there would be offers for me but um unfortunately I, I had an injury that obviously curtailed the end of that season and took a little while to come back from um but no there was never any in concrete with me and I, listen i was always very grateful to be at bournemouth and but if something came up maybe maybe it would have looked a little bit different for me but i tend not to really think about it that way i'm more grateful for what i did get rather than what i didn't and you stuck around, Warren, under Kevin Bond. Uh, how was that? Um, you know, Kevin was actually a really, really nice man, and I still still speak to him now. Um, he had a difficult... Whoever came in to replace Sean had a difficult task um, for a number of reasons. So the finances were getting worse. 
Um, the squad wasn't as good. People had left. All their better players were leaving the club. So he was left with a shell of a squad compared to what it previously looked like. Uh, and then also with having to replace Sean. You know, who, who's going to replace Sean when he'd done so much uh, for the football club? It was always going to be a hard task. But I always got on well with Kevin. We had clashes, of course. We had many a clash, actually, when I think back. Um, but he's someone that I respected. And I think at the, by the end of his time, I thought he got a very raw deal by the football club. I think he was very undeserving at that moment in time to lose his job. And then he got replaced by the Jimmy Quinn, of course. Uh, and did you have many fallouts with him? Because apparently you weren't his biggest fan. Um, so when he came in, he, um, he gave me a lot of responsibility. He gave me a lot of confidence. He spoke very highly of me. Um, and I initially, I enjoyed playing under. And when I say initially, I talk about maybe three or four games. I thought, I, thought, I like what this guy's all about. He wanted us to play attractive football. It was always positive. And then within a matter of, and I'm talking days, you know, one or two bad results. And then all of a sudden, like his ethos on how he wanted to play attractive football went completely out the window. And by the end, you know, you never want people to lose their jobs. I would never want anyone to do that. But the football club had to replace him and replace him really quickly because it was a horrible atmosphere for the fans with Jimmy, with us and Jimmy as players. I fell out of favour. I went from being the blue-eyed boy on day one to 90 days later, I'm not playing in the team for him anymore and he don't even talk to me anymore. So I, I, can, I can wait for him to go, to be honest. And so it was a godsend when it did happen. So Marvin Bartley told a story about uh, he used to bring his dog and walk his dog at training. Is that true? Yeah, bizarre. You know, you'd be training. But remember, we were on a pitch at Dean Court training session on a one given day, and he had his dog, and we're doing a possession practice, and it's quite intense. And the lads are into the session, and the dog's just like a roam in the middle of the session, and it's like getting in your way while you're trying to kick a ball. I'm like, what is going on here? Do you know what I mean like get you know talk about professionalism and standards? And you got the bloody manager with a dog and a pitch ruining the session. That's that's not great. And apparently you were trying to wind the dog up in order to get a bit of re uh, a reaction from it. Is that right? Well, I was trying to bite my ankles, so I had to give it a little bit back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Jeff? Uh, Brett Pittman also talked about a, a trip to Aldershot where you did some sort of army training. He said that was the that was the killer for him. Yeah, that was um, a low point. He took us three days before a game, a FA Cup game against Bristol Rovers, and he took us to an army camp in Aldershot. Very tough regime. Um, and Darren Anderton, I remember, like he pulled out of that within a day. He just weren't having it one bit. He's like, I can't do this. Like The things we were being made to do was just ridiculous. You know, I'm all for team bonding, but we weren't in not at that venue, not how they were trying to do it. It was just ridiculous. And we had, we had a campfire one night, and we had to stand up and talk 10 minutes about yourself um, or five minutes about yourself, give a rundown of your life, your career, sit back down just to get to know one another. And Jimmy got up and honestly, he spoke for about an hour about himself and how many goals he'd scored, how many clubs he'd got promoted, how he'd saved so many clubs from relegation. It's like, and at that moment, I was like, nah, not for me. You're not for me. But ironically, we won the game on the Saturday in the FA Cup against Bristol Rovers. So I take it, he took all the credit for that based on the army camp, wasn't it? Right, he took as much credit as he ever could, but I'm not sure his record stands up to taking that much credit. <laughs> no. But it must have been tough going through those points deduction seasons at, at the same time, Warren, because you lived through through minus 10, minus 17, didn't you? So how was that? Yeah, tough. You know, it was a build-up over a lot of years, wasn't it? The financial restrictions that the club had, um, it had to come ahead somehow. Um, my, my regret is it's a stain on my, me personally, you know, that was my one relegation I had in my career, and it was only because we went down by one point in a season that, um, because the club didn't have any money, that you know we're punished with a ten-point deduction, and I find that incredibly unfair on the players. You know, we done our jobs on the pitch; we would have been a League One team still, but because of finances, we're no longer a League One team. So I found that quite tough to take. And then, of course, the double whammy when you go into the following season and you know you're starting on minus seventeen. It's like, is this for real? Yeah, minus yeah. seven. I mean, when you are ha, have got those deductions, I mean, that's just crazy. Like, you know, six wins to get, you know, a point on the board. Um, uh, you know, before the season started, do you think, you know, we're doomed or did you have the belief at an early stage or, you know, when did the belief happen that, you know, we can actually do this? Um, I think, no, I think 
initially I was like, I was confident with the squad of players. Where I was thinking, yeah, we'll, we'll stay up. I know it's a tough task, but but then within two or three games, very quickly, I was like, mm, no, this is going to be too tough to do this one. Uh, and it was only when Eddie came in that it was ever going to change. You know, it had to change. It couldn't be. Uh, it couldn't be Kevin. It couldn't be Jimmy. Although Kevin, I think, probably would have deserved to stay in it for a little bit longer. But Jimmy certainly couldn't be that man to take it forward. But even when Eddie came in, you still could have predicted from the position we were in that we would have achieved um, staying up in the league. Um, but it was ultimately down to Eddie coming in, and that's why it changed. And in the meantime, Brian, you enjoyed your, your role in Doncaster's promotion season, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, on the last game of the season, you know, we had to go to Cheltenham. And yeah. um, and basically try and basically win the game. We were second in the league for quite some time, um, and we ended up like you know we we played quite well, uh, but we ended up missing out on the last day of the season, having to go through the playoffs, um, being second place for that long, and then missing out on that you know is can be demoralising. But you know we um, we beat we I think we went away to Southend. Um, tough place at the time. We drew nil nil. Um, we then beat them four one or five one at home. Five one, thank you. Uh, and obviously then you know playing Leeds uh, in in a final, um, setting up the winner for for James Sater. You know, great occasion. Must have been special. The old Bournemouth connection. Yeah, I mean, I played with James at three different clubs. Um, what a great player! Uh, what an intelligent player! And you know. We almost had that sort of mentality that we both knew, like we linked, we linked up well. I, you know, I assisted for quite a few of his goals over the years, and you know, he was just a player that you wanted to play with in your team. You know, what a great player um, and a great, great, great person as well. That um, playoff semi-final, I seem to remember it. Yeah, it was at home. It was a five-one. I watched it. Um, you know, very jealous. I think James Coppinter scored a hat trick that night. I think did he? Uh, yeah, um, it was nil nil at the time, and you know. Before the game, I used to sit next to James Hayter. Um, and I used to, at the time, I used to have a, a technique of taking penalties. I used to go left, right, then middle. Um, so it's gone left, right, middle, and it's come to this game. And I said to Paul before the game, I, I whispered to Hates, I said, Hates, you want the pens? Because it's ended up down the middle, and I've got to stick to it. He says, do you want it? He went, nah. Uh, so, you know, at nil-nil, we get a penalty, I think about 15 minutes in, and I'm thinking, I've got to go down the middle. Uh, and, you know, fortunate enough, you know, I, I, I ended up passing it down the middle, thinking that the keeper had to dive and, you know, obviously went one nil up. And then, you know, you're right, James Cobber just stole the show. Mm. And it looked um, like he had just basically taken the brand of football that he deployed at Bournemouth and, you know, taken it to Doncaster. And some of the football I thought was... Yeah, you know, sort of ahead of its time for that kind of level club. Um, what was different at Doncaster? Was it just the fact they had more resources for him to make it a success than he could at Bournemouth, maybe? I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, we we signed probably one of the best players I've played with in, in Richie Wellens. Um, technically a fantastic player. Um, and then we, we sort of, you know, we aligned it with, you know, signing the likes of James Hayter, and Billy Sharp came along at the time, Matt Mills. You know, we had some really good players um, and, and we bought into Sean's ideas. And yeah, you're right. We, we played some fantastic football. We used to sometimes play teams off the pitch. You know, sometimes not necessarily getting the right result, um, especially in our first year in the championship. We didn't know what to, you know, we didn't know where to turn. Uh, Boxing Day, we, we go away to Nottingham Forest and beat them 4-1. Um, and we then go on a 10-game unbeaten run, uh, which then, you know, remained our status in the championship. And I always remember going to Sheffield Wednesday uh, and not playing particularly well first half. And in the second half, I revert back to how, you know, Sean used to sort of conduct himself. And, and when he used to sort of start to kick bins or throw stuff or shout, you, you stood up and listened. Um, and I remember him saying, you know, if I'm going to get sacked as a manager, I want to get sacked playing the right football the right way. So go out back out there and play football and pass the ball. Mm -hmm. And we almost... You know, and we just went out there and that was a turning point for us there. But that just epitomised, you know, how he used to take all the pressure off of us and just go out and express yourself, um, which for me as a creative midfield player, I loved. And with so many Bournemouth connections at Doncaster, were you keeping an eye on what was happening at your old club and all the, the traumas that they were going through during these times? 
Of course, yeah. You know, when I, when I left, I mean, that gave vital funds for the club. Um, one of the things that sort of got the deal over the line was that they needed the money all up front, which Preston agreed to. Um, so that helped. Um, but clubs were aware of the situation. You know, I mean, my, the very first bid that ever came in for me was an ex-manager of Warren's in... Um, uh, who's, who is it, Warren? Gary Megson. Yeah, that's it. I just lost his name. And Megson. And, and he put an offer into the club and he said to the club, for every day that you do not accept this offer, it's going to go down £5,000. Like, so everyone was aware of the situation, the financial constraints of the club. Um, so, you know, obviously the club accepted it behind Sean's back, but it wasn't particularly great. Um, and I went back straight away on the Monday to say goodbye to everyone properly, shake hands, um, you know, and obviously, you know, I think they went on a, a pretty bad run after that. But, you know, I don't think that, that was anything to do with myself leaving or anything. But um, for a club like Bournemouth to lose one or two players, given the size of the squads and the quality and the depth of the squad would, would affect them. And then, of course, at Bournemouth, uh, Warren, I mean, you know, Eddie Howe came in um, and as a supporter, it felt like he was almost like a, you know, a lamb to the slaughter, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a tough job. It was backs against the wall. You know, it was an impossible situation. Um, maybe that, maybe, I don't know if Eddie would agree with that, but it might have taken the pressure off slightly because no one ever expected us to get into the position that we got ourselves back into. So it may have helped in a, in a way. I suppose the closer you get to the point where we actually have a little bit of success and a couple of wins and the closer that you get to the point of staying in the league, then maybe the pressure then starts to build up because initially the expectation was never there. And when it got to that... Uh... That sort of crunch week towards the end of the season. I mean, how how did you feel going into those games? Yeah, the Chester and Grimsby, they were, they were tough. You know, I think uh, I think as players, there's always different pressure moments within your career. But that was that was tough moments to think that you've got to a situation that you can get yourself out of it. And that was certainly a pressure moment for the players and the expectation. But I think the great thing was we were on such a good run that. Everyone was so united. The fans were completely united behind us. You know, I remember going to Chester, and I don't know how many we took that day, but I remember it was a lot of Bournemouth fans and rolling up to the ground and thinking, oh, you know, everyone's behind you here. We've got the fans back on side from six months earlier. You know, there was a divide probably between the fans and the players because of how we were playing and what was going on. So, um, so to reunite was really special. Um, so, but yeah, it was, a, it was a good week in the end, but I, I wouldn't say you could enjoy it over Lake as the job had to be done. And then the following season, of course, we, you know, we really did kick on. And it feels like uh, numerous times in my Bournemouth uh, supporting career, there's always sort of, you know, golden generation that, um, you know, probably could have achieved more than you know, what it did. But thankfully, we did make it. And it all culminated in that match at Burton Albion, which is great. Um, how was that season for you as a whole, Warren? Um, it, it makes them personally. It was mixed emotions. I mean, obviously, great that we achieved what we did. Um, we, we were on a transfer embargo, so we had sixteen players and not allowed to sign anyone. So to achieve promotion with sixteen players was incredible. Um, so that was obviously very special for me. It was uh, bittersweet at times. Um, I played the first, I think, twenty-five games, uh, and then I made a fatal error of judgment, getting myself sent off um, at Aldershot out of stupidity. And from that moment, we were actually allowed to sign one player, and that one player was Royce Wiggins. So then I very rarely started matches between the sec between that moment and the second half of the season. Uh, but I was also a team player. I was never uh, jealous. I would never you know, become that sort of person who didn't give my all regardless. But it was hard having played the first half of the season and not playing as much in the second half, um, even though the overall promotion was obviously still a great achievement. And how did you feel when, when Eddie moved on? Um, yeah, it was sad. It was a little bit like when Sean left. Uh, you felt like, you know, how do you replace Eddie? That's that's exactly how it felt. It was exactly how it felt when, when Sean had gone. You know, how do you replace him? Because we had gained success um, like we had under Sean. Um, so it, it was sad, but I think for Eddie... I think he probably had to do it at that moment in time because his, his stock was high. He wanted to give himself a different looking challenge. Um, but certainly for players, we knew it was going to be different and it was going to be a tough task for whoever came in. Now, 
Yeah. Well, Brian, of course, you joined Eddie at Burnley. Um, how did that move come about? Um, well, obviously at Doncaster, um, Sean actually got the sack and Dean Saunders came in uh, and we became almost like a circus overnight. You know, things were going wrong in the training ground. Uh, the players were turning up on the day of the game. You know, some very experienced players, you know, I won't mention names, but players that have played in Premier League, you know, numerous appearances. Um, but really didn't really want to fight for the club, you know, happy to pick up their money. Um, so we got relegated. Um, I had a clause in my contract that meant that I would have a 30% deduction in my wages. So I, I felt that I had to move on. The club were happy for me to move on to get off the wage bill. Um, and although it took a few weeks to get over the line, um, for whatever reason, I don't know, um, it's quite a complicated procedure for Burnley to do transfers. Um, you know, I, obviously I joined Eddie and Jason, you know, and it was a situation where it's a, it's a weird one because I've gone from having Eddie as a teammate, as a friend, you know, from cleaning boots, you know, with Jason Tindall, uh, you know, as a boot boy, to now all of a sudden now, and I have to respect them as a manager and assistant manager. And I think, you know, looking back, uh, you know, and, and Warren will probably vouch for this as well. I think what the one thing that Eddie done brilliantly was that he separated that divide between friendship and management and he set down his rules. Um, and I think he gained, although one or two maybe have got a little bit upset with it, he gained a lot of respect that way. Um, I went in there to his office within, I think it was a week when I knew I wasn't starting the first game to say, why not? Um, and I came out with a tail between my legs uh, and I saw a different side to Eddie that I've never seen before. But I think in order for him to have the success that he's had and the respect, you know, uh, you know, there's no surprise that he's gone on to what he's achieved for, for the club. Um, what was your take on his time? Uh, pretty difficult from what uh, what we've heard. Yeah, obviously, you know, I speak to Eddie and Jason on a regular basis. You know, they come to the training ground quite a bit as well. And, you know, when, when you play for a club like Burnley, you know, you don't necessarily live in, in the area. Um, but coming from a club like Bournemouth, where, you know, the area is a lovely place to live in. Um, it's a family type club with, with you know, the supporters, you um, and it's, it's sort of almost like once you've played for Bournemouth, there becomes that connection. It's a strange thing because I've played for four, three other clubs and you don't really necessarily have that bond. Um, I, maybe coming through the youth team, I might have a bias with that. So, so having all those sort of situations uh, and giving so far away from the club, um, it was a situation where Eddie maybe had to put his family as well as himself first. Um, it was a bit of a a shock to me because I'd only just signed for the club and he left three weeks later. So for me, it was a disappointment. Um, even though I didn't actually play much under Eddie, um, I was only just signed. Um, it was the right decision for him and the right decision for his family. He, um, yeah, Eddie Howe, a ball that has always played, tried and, tested, uh, tried and tested players. He's always had loyalty. So Warren, was it frustrating to have gone just before he returned? Because I can imagine that um, if you were still there, you'd have probably got a number of games and you know carried on at Bournemouth maybe. Yeah, perhaps. Um, but in all honesty, I, I think it was the right decision for me to no longer be at the club. Um, I think my capabilities as a player at that moment in time um, weren't aligned to where the club was trying to get to. Um, so I, I'm quite open to admit, I don't think I was um, the player that would needed to have played in a team that were aspiring to become a championship club um, at that moment in time. So I think it's fair to say that, yeah, it was the right thing for me to go. Um, whether I would have got a better opportunity to stay if Eddie, Eddie had come back a little bit earlier, then I don't know. But yeah, I, I, but another thing about Eddie, look, I, there's no blind loyalty about him. You know, he, you will only play for Eddie if you deserve to play, you know, and that I know is sometimes I hear a little bit of criticism that he's too loyal to players. And let me tell you, he, he will only play a player given them what they've done in that week in training. And that, well, that'll always be the case for him. So if player X fans don't want to see him in the team, he's in that team because Eddie genuinely believes he deserves it on that day because of how he's trained that week. And, and, in terms of international recognition, Brian, I think you, you beat Warren 3-1, don't you? Although, do you count a game against Hong Kong as a Scottish cap, Warren? I'll, I'll count it. Don't worry about that. I've had many questions <laughs> about it, but I'll count it. If it's, hey, if it's on Wikipedia, you're counting it. 
Hundred <laughs> percent. Do you, do you wish you, you and Kenny Dalglish in it? How many have you got yeah. together? Me and two caps between us. Do you wish you'd got more uh, international opportunities? Yeah, of course. It's uh, undoubtedly. I, I think I was restricted in terms of um, the level that we were at at Bournemouth at the time. So maybe my potential as a player wasn't uh, in line with playing as a League Two player. So I think that was always going to restrict me. I can't imagine there'd be many two uh, League Two players that would, would get too many international opportunities. And um, the manager at the time, Bertie Vogue, said that to me. He said, you know, um, he actually questioned, he said, why do you play at such a low level? Um, and he was very complimentary about me. And he just explained, look, he said, while well, you're there, he said, I can't play you. And I was like, yeah, I understand that. No problem. What about you, Brian? How did it work out for you in Wales? Well, when you're when you're Welsh through and through, you know, it's an absolute no-brainer when they come <laughs> asking to play for you. <laughs> <laughs> Is it so your- I, I went there on holiday once, um, and when they said, would you like to play? Two thousand, yeah. The Millennium Stadium, that counts. It was a yeah. level from that moment. Was, was that the reason? Because you went to the Millennium Stadium and got a bench place? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, obviously I played for the 21s, um, you know, which is a great experience. We were terrible as a team. I think the stats for the Welsh under 21 side was they hadn't won in about four or five years. But, you know, at the time, if I'm going to be brutally honest, I wasn't worried about that. I was more worried about building my CV up. Um, and and I, realistically, I was never going to play for England. So, you know, when my grandmother found out that I, she was born there, yeah, it was a no-brainer when I got asked. Um, and I think roughly around about sort of, you know, when we were playing really well at Doncaster, 2009-ish, I think it was. Um, you know, I, I, the biggest thing when you play for these, when you go to internationals, especially when you first, when you're a new face, is you almost have to do your time. You have to travel. You might necessarily not get on. You might be on the bench. Obviously, if you're a superstar like Gareth Bale, is you know, you're in the squad no matter what. But when you're away uh, and potentially away for 10 days and you don't play, you come back thinking, is it really worth it? Um, and at the time when I was at Doncaster, I, I was suffering with one or two injuries with my back. And when you're going away traveling, although you get picked up from door to door, you're in different cars, you're in different beds, you're in a different environment. You know, my injuries tended to get worse rather than other people going away for two or three breaks, you know, days for a break and resting, which is probably what I needed to do. Um, and although I pulled out of a few squads, you know, I was delighted to actually get my opportunity. Um, and I think that coincided me sort of kicking off, say, if I'm going to come to one more squad and not play, then I'm not going to come again. Uh, and, you know, lo and behold, you know, the, the next time I got called up, I, I started against Russia. Um, which then totally changes the whole aspect of going to play international football. Mm. Now, Warren, you obviously went to AFC Wimbledon, uh, had a sit with Paul Town, but then um, you know both of you were at Haven and Waterlooville for a bit. Uh, you know, what was that like? And you know, did you feel better than what you were at that level? No, no. To be honest, I think I was at the right level at the right time. Um, very apparent that one of my capabilities was um, to be able to run and run quick and run for long periods of, of time and, and I could no longer do that. My body wouldn't allow it. So I think, you know, I was able to play at that level because of my experience and not because of physical capabilities. So I think it was it was right for me to be at that level. I never I always felt that any time in my career, I normally was at the right level. I should have been at given on what my capabilities were at that moment. Um, I mean, when I went to Wimbledon, in League Two, I was a car crash, an absolute car crash. Um, you know how they, they might. I mean, the fans don't particularly like me anyway, um, because I got a two-year contract and I didn't, I didn't put in great performances. It wasn't for the lack of trying. I just my legs had gone. Um, so I kind of, I kind of conned them into giving me two-year contract there. So that's probably why they've not forgiven me. And was it nice to work with uh, Lee Bradbury again? I uh, haven't. Yeah, very much so, um, as well as being my manager at Bournemouth briefly when he took over from Eddie. Um, obviously, he was a friend, so a very nice a guy that I've got so much respect for. Um, as I say, a, a good friend, and, and it was nice to to go back and work with him again. Um, I think maybe the Bournemouth job just came a little tiny bit too early for him. You know, if he rolled on how he looked like as a manager a little bit later on, 
it would certainly would put him in better stead to take a Bournemouth job rather than when he initially got it, where he was a player going straight into that role. But it was certainly good to work under him because our friendship was there and working again with Brian and, and James Hayter. It was nice to be able to travel down with, with friends that you'd played with, you know, 12, 14 years previous. Mm, guess I've what about you, uh, Brian? Because it didn't go so well for you after Eddie left at Burnley. So how did your career end up at having at Waterlooville? Um, well, in fact, when Eddie left, I actually ended up starting to play. So it was a bonus <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> I actually played more games. So, yeah, I mean, Sean, Sean Dyche came in. Uh, didn't change too much to start with, but then put his own, own ideas in. Um, my style of play, if I'm being honest, although I played a few games under Sean Dyche, didn't really fit his sort of style. Um, he wanted players that would run hard and uh, and almost cover grass rather than dictate the game of the football. So um, I knew my chances would be limited, but, you know, we were favourites to get relegated that year, but we ended up getting promoted. And um, although I didn't clock up loads of appearances that season, I was always amongst it um, uh, in the squad trying to drive individuals and, you know, the two central midfield players at the time, um, Dean Marnie and, and uh, Dave Jones, they never got injured all season. So, you know, sometimes that's a sign of a successful side when you don't need to change um, too many players. But I remember when I did get released, um, I agreed everything with uh, Barnsley to go and sign a two-year deal there. And I waited and waited and waited. And I sort of was turning down one or two other options elsewhere. Um, and it seemed to me that, you know, they might have been looking elsewhere. Um, so I went and go and train at Oldham. They offered me a contract on, on my first day under Lee Johnson. Um, I turned that down on the basis of signing there. Um, at the time, it was double what Oldham were offering. So it was a no brainer for me and I could travel from where I was living in, in Manchester. Um, but that never materialised. And when when you look at a footballer's career, and you have a, a young family, that's probably the one thing I would say um, is something that goes underestimated, you know, the strains that you, you, your partner and the family are under. And then when you look at my son who's going into secondary school, am I being a selfish by going somewhere else to sign a year's contract, whereas, you know, realistically, he needs to settle and make friends for the next five, ten years. So I came down, I was going to give up football at the time, but I signed for Haven't. Uh, heard some good things, obviously, with Warren there. James um, eventually signed as well. Um, and I sort of had the love for football back again. And, you know, we although we got relegated, um, we bounced back with two successful years. And I left the club um, with some memories I never thought I'd make. Mm. So you're both involved with the club now, aren't you? So, Warren, you're with the under-13s and Stocky, you're with the under-14s. How's all that going for you at the moment? Start with Warren. Yeah, it's fantastic. Great environment. Uh, very fortunate. So uh, Brian's desk is literally three yards from my desk in our office. Uh, so it, it's great that you can come through with players that you mentioned earlier that still, you know, ex-teammates, but also now working back together at the football club that we all love so much and still to be able to be a part of it. Um, very special. And it's very, uh, it's hard work. It's hard work. A lot of stuff that you probably wouldn't think that goes on for the children that we have to do. And it is it is tough, long hours, but it is incredibly rewarding. You know, we, we've got some players with a lot of potential. And like Brian alluded to earlier, we hope that we can we can get them into the, the higher echelons of football at some point. But we are very fortunate. And it is a, I feel very proud to have the, the role that I have. Mm. Brian? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'll echo... You know what Warren said. You know when when you when you come out of football um, and and at the time we got promoted, at haven't and I'm and I'm playing. I feel fit. And uh, when an opportunity like this came along at a club where you know that you know you've got such great memories and a club that you love, um, a decision had to be made. And in the January of of, of last year, you know I chose that decision to retire to take up the opportunity of. Uh, under 14s coach uh, and it's at the time I remember walking into thinking what am I doing you know I'm, I've gone from walking in you know with a pair of boots to holding a laptop and I'm like for the first two weeks I promise you I was in tears thinking what am I doing you know I could still be playing now I could have even have another year and I'm thinking like what am I doing and I couldn't put my mind I couldn't get my head around it um, you know but when I when I look back at it now 
you know, those two weeks are a distant memory. And like Warren says, you know, when, when you're sort of going into a, an office environment, which is almost similar to a change room environment, you know, when you look at retiring from football, it's probably, I couldn't think of a better substitute for, for uh, retiring from football. And uh, $6 million question then, what's going to happen in the final nine games? Warren, do you want to go first? Listen, it, it, it's tough. Our running doesn't look pleasant on paper, if I'm honest. But, um, you know, the biggest thing that would give me confidence would be our manager, Eddie Howe. You know, he's he's guided the club over a lot of difficult moments. This is just another one to add to the list. So as long as he's in charge, uh, yeah, I, I'm confident that the job will get done. Um, albeit it's going to be tough. But with him and the players that we have at our... Um, at our disposal, then I don't see any reason. You know, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be easy without any fans there, that's for sure. Uh, but if anyone can do the job, then it's certainly him. What words of motivation are you giving, Eddie, Brian? Well, I won't be giving him any words of motivation because, uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of disrespect him with that. I, obviously, you know, I would encourage him if, if ever that opportunity came along. But... Um, if there's ever going to be a manager in the Premier League that's going to be prepared for a scenario like this, it's going to be Eddie. You know, he, I can vouch for this, having worked with him at Burnley. He'd been at six and he wouldn't leave till six. You know, that's just his work ethic. Um, so in terms of preparation, you know, he'll be, he'll have everything covered and the players will be prepared. Um, you know, the they're lucky now they've got Brooks back. That'll be a big bonus for them. I think they've missed him in the, in the team. Um, but as far as um, what I think will happen, you know, I, I don't know. And I wouldn't like to comment. I just hope that they, they you know, they all perform, give everything they got because it's a, it's, a, it's a scenario where I think it's going to be very, very strange for every single club, whether at the top or the bottom of the league. And finally, just to wrap up, I mean, obviously Bournemouth is, uh, you know, a beautiful place to live. Um, and we've heard on interviews before, Harry Redknapp uh, used to do it. Tony Pulis, when he signed players, would always guide them and say, you know, driving you know, past the Westcliff so they can get a good view of the beach. I know that Eddie Howe has taken certain players around or Fletch has been driving them around to show them, you know, what the whole area is like. Um, and with yourselves um, still at the club and many... Uh, players that we've probably got on our books now quite possibly you know retiring in the area and with that plus the new training facility um the future you know could be bright for Bournemouth couldn't it but um you know hopefully the Premier League uh you know football will stay in place but um you know Warren what's the sort of new training facility going to bring to your youth group because at the moment you're sort of all over the place aren't you yeah, that's right. And I think it's going to be a massive moment for the football club. You know, you'd like to think that uh, whatever happens with our status as a Premier League club, that we leave a legacy somehow. And if the legacy is going to be a training ground that for our young players to develop further than they already are, um, it'll be a massive thing um, to house them in an area that will be next to the first team so they can aspire to those guys that are in our first team environment. You know, it's a hell of a thing for them to be looking at every day when they're coming into training. Um, I mean, they're already motivated now, but um, to be able to see the first team training in the same environment that you're training in every night, then that's going to be a huge thing for us. So it's something I'm really excited about. And we, we just hope that that job gets done. and uh, It will happen, but we want it sooner rather than later. And are you seeing some decent players, hockey in your under-14s at the moment that you're thinking, hang on, they got a hell of a chance? Yeah, you know... You know, there's some talented children right the way through the whole of the academy, not just my under-14s. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing for us um, in order to, to sort of challenge our players is the training ground being built in order to get uh, academy um, status at CAT2. That changes the whole complexity of everything in terms of our games programme. We're then, we're then maybe even playing CAT1 teams on a more regular basis. So then that demand becomes even more. I think that's you know, vital. Uh, and I think if we have that indoor facility, um, we might then just compete with the likes of Southampton in terms of recruiting, you know, the best talent in the area. Well, talking of Southampton, what was the score last time you played them, Brian? Yeah, we we, um, we beat Southampton. Um, when we look at my first game, we got beat quite considerably, you know, you know 8-1, I think it was, um, recently. 
Although I will say this, I didn't actually manage the kids. <laughs> my there you are. There so, you but are. I'm taking full credit for it because it's the players that beat them. But um, yeah, no, um, it, it took, to be able to beat the lights of Southampton, who are regarded as one of the you know, the best academies in the country, and you know, it's not about the scoreline. It really isn't. It's about developing the players. But you know, the players get a lot of confidence out of beating the likes of Southampton and you know that it just goes to show like in performances there on after that you know they take a lot of um, confidence out of those sort of games and victories Was it Warren who was coaching that game? Yeah. I was there no, I, I watched the game but I can't take any credit for that one no but it doesn't run through the whole academy because my under 13s went down to Southampton and got beat 7-2 so um it was a one-off game for the, for us to beat them, I think. So I need to aspire to be like Brian a little bit more. <laughs> we have a, we have a good competition with the kids. Give give my assistant the job for the day, maybe. <laughs> we have a good challenge on day release on a Thursday. The kids come out of school, so the 13s and 14s. So we end up having a game against Warren quite often. And it's always, uh, if we go 1-0 up, it's one of those, like, you know, are you all right over there? Like. You can imagine the banter battle. that comes between me and him. Oh, yes. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I've got to say, guys, thank you so much for coming on tonight. We've had a load of comments uh, coming through. Uh, you know, big love for what you're doing now and certainly um, with your respective playing careers as well. So thank you very much, Warren. Appreciate you having, uh, having you on. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. And also, Stocky, really appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah likewise. It's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you. And Jeff, once again, thank you for being my comrade on the podcast. No, uh, thank you. Great to relive some of those old times. Really fantastic. That's the last like, interview we're probably doing on this Sunday night, Jeff. I mean, I don't know what we're going to do now. I suppose we're going to have to talk about football, aren't we? We're going to have to. Can't wait, actually, Sam. No yeah, offence. No, can I? And it's live on the BBC uh, six days' time on Saturday. Cannot wait. Uh, and thank you for watching. Thank you for taking part. Uh, remember to hit the like button on this video. And do subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next video. Up the cherries. Cheers, guys. Oscar, back in the day. Oscar, back in the day.